Welcome back to another video for IB Environmental Systems and Societies. Today we're talking about topic 3.1, an introduction to biodiversity. The first big idea in topic 3.1 is that biodiversity can be identified in a bunch of different forms. And those are species diversity, habitat diversity, and genetic diversity. You should remember all three of those terms. The idea here is that more habitats create more unique combinations of biotic and abiotic factors, which create more ecological niches and more ecological niches provide opportunities for a greater diversity of species to live. Within a species, genetic diversity means that a range of individuals may be more or less suited for that unique combination of environmental factors within a particular niche or habitat. Biodiversity is a big concept that incorporates species habitat and genetic diversity. For the moment, I want to focus on two terms from topic 2.5 that you should already know. And if you don't, you should remember them now. The first is species richness. That's simply the number of different species found in an area. The second part of biodiversity is called species evenness. And that's how those species are distributed within an ecosystem. So here we have two different communities. They both have the same number of species. So they both have the same species richness, but this one on the left has a more even distribution of species. Not one of them dominates. Therefore this habitat or this community on the left is generally considered to be more diverse because the community on the right is dominated by this one tree species that you see here. This image exemplifies the concept of genetic diversity. All of these carrots are the same species, but because they have different combinations of alleles in their genomes, they have different phenotypes or physical appearances. That means some of these carrots may be better suited for certain climatic or soil conditions. Most people think of biodiversity as simply the number of species in an area. And generally speaking, that's probably the broadest idea of the concept. Species diversity is both the number of different species, species richness, and their relative abundance or distribution across this ecosystem. That's the species evenness. One of the things that you learned about in topic 2.5, when we we're investigating ecosystems is how to objectively measure biodiversity. That's where Simpson's diversity index or Simpson's reciprocal index comes into play. That is probably the best standard way to assess biodiversity in an area. Habitat diversity, as you might guess by the name, is the range of different habitats found within an ecosystem. On the screen, you see four different habitats in Brazil. The one on the top left is mostly open grasses. The top right has some grasslands and low-lying shrubs. Bottom left is a secondary forest. As you can see, it's quite bright. There's still a fair amount of sunlight coming through. The canopy isn't closed. And in the bottom right corner, you have the darker, more dense primary forest. Because these habitats have different combinations of abiotic factors, they support different species of both plants and animals. Again, we're going to come back to these two concepts of species richness and species evenness because they are important. You should be able to use both of these terms when discussing different components of biodiversity on your ESS exam. Remember, species richness is what most people think of when they think of biodiversity. It's the number of species in an area. Species evenness is how those species are distributed within an ecosystem. One of the reasons Simpson's index is so important is that we can describe communities of organisms using those diversity indices. Low diversity can tell us a lot about a particular area. It frequently indicates that there is pollution, such as eutrophication or some other type of negative human impact on the biological components of an ecosystem. If we go back to the idea of succession in topic two, we also know that diversity levels change throughout the course of succession. In different phases, there are different levels of biodiversity. So by being able to measure the biodiversity, we can assess where in the successional process an area is. I really like this image to exemplify the idea of habitat diversity. In this single watershed, where all of the precipitation that falls between these mountain ridges drains out through the water course in the middle, you have a really wide range of habitats. Right? We have 
bare rock here in the mountains. We have some low-lying plants in the mountains, coniferous forests lower down on the slopes. Here along the, the waterways, we have riparian zones. We also have these sand and gravel banks. And each one of those habitats has a unique combination of microclimate, physical conditions that make it possible for different plants and animals to grow there. So this is why habitat diversity leads to greater species diversity. Just like the carrot example earlier, genetic diversity results in greater variation within a single species. So all of these butterflies have different physical appearances as a result of the allele and genetic combinations in their genomes. Some of them are blue, some of them are red, some are some shades in between. The reason that genetic diversity and variation leads to greater degrees of biodiversity is because in different environments, different individuals have greater chances of successful reproduction. In this environment, the blue butterflies stand out against the background while the red ones remain much better hidden. That means the blue butterflies are more likely to be eaten by predators and the red butterflies are more likely to have successful reproduction and pass on their genes. This leads to speciation. Should the environment change, the reverse can be true. In this case, the blue butterflies are the ones who are well camouflaged and hidden, and the red butterflies are the ones that are most likely to be eaten. That means the, the blue butterflies are more likely to be able to pass on their genes and survive. Conservation efforts depend on our ability to effectively measure or assess biodiversity. If we go into the field and we can identify areas on our planet where there is a high degree of species diversity or genetic diversity within species or a high degree of habitat diversity, then we know where we should be concentrating our conservation efforts. This map shows biodiversity hotspots around the world. The different shades of red, orange, and yellow on the map indicate varying degrees of threats to biodiversity. The areas that are red are most impacted by human populations and see the greatest threat to the loss of biodiversity. If you notice in this infographic, you can see in this band of tropical rainforest all around the globe, this is where biodiversity is concentrated. That's because of the high levels of net primary productivity in tropical rainforest, those climatic conditions that allow plants to grow year round. Singapore is found in what used to be tropical rainforest. You can see in this map from 1819, about 200 years ago, that Singapore was almost entirely primary rainforest and freshwater swamp forest. Then about 170 years later, the island of Singapore is almost exclusively urban and agricultural land with some patches of secondary forest in the middle. What that has meant for Singapore is that the vast majority of reptiles and amphibians are extinct or threatened with extinction. A similar pattern exists across Southeast Asia, again with amphibians and reptiles showing the greatest risk of extinction due to human impacts. You should remember that biodiversity really exists on three different levels. The broadest one is ecosystem or habitat diversity. The greater the range of habitats, the greater the range or variety of species that live in that area. Within a single species, there are of course differences among individuals and, and those differences are the result of genetic differences. As we discuss the importance of assessing biodiversity, we need to remember that that assessment is only as solid as the quality of the data that we collect. Data describes patterns and that data influences decision-making. We can make better decisions if we have better data. So our ability to assess biodiversity depends on making reliable, repeatable investigations in the field. There are a number of factors that can affect the quality of the data that we can collect about biodiversity. Some places are harder to access and therefore aren't studied as well. Some species are harder to count because they're microscopic or they are challenging to find within the environment. The diagram you see on the screen shows many of the different threats to biodiversity 
in the Amazon rainforest. Not all of these threats are equal. Generally speaking, the bigger the circle, the greater the threat to diversity. And they don't always add up to 100% because many of those threats overlap. Generally speaking, when the forest is first opened up to logging, what then follows is agriculture. So these two factors work together as a threat to biodiversity. Having reliable data about the habitat diversity, species diversity, and genetic diversity within an area helps decision makers choose a course of action, whether to proceed with a conservation project or a development project. The better the data, the more well-informed the process is, and hopefully humans will make the right decision. That's it for topic 3.1, Introduction to Biodiversity. If you found this video useful, please give it a like and consider subscribing to my channel. You can also find additional resources for ESS at my website, www.mrcremerscience.com. Thank you for watching.